Hey everyone, this is Jackson from Project Beacon. We're just gonna get started in a couple minutes. We'll let folks get here at the top of the hour and then we'll get moving. All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, as you guys know, uh, very clearly when you joined, uh, the, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, be mindful of that. Also ask you to um, mute yourself uh, unless you're, you're speaking up to ask a question. Uh, super helpful to make sure that everybody's muted at the top of this. Uh, I'm Jackson Wilkinson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of, uh, at Project Beacon. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Brett Cook, who's our Chief of Staff at, at Project Beacon. He is in the chat, and uh, you, you can see that he's going to be responding to questions uh, throughout the session. So if you, have a, if you have a question that you would like an answer to, then you, probably your best bet is to ask it in the chat. Uh, Brett can, can take care of many of those. He'll uh, raise any uh, to me that, that might need to be amplified a little bit. But super excited to talk to all of you about uh, the, the program that we've been setting up uh, with DESI in the state to help facilitate Binax testing uh, at your schools. And I want to, um, for, for those of you who joined us a few, a couple weeks ago now, uh, at the at the Desi uh, webinar that sort of introduced this program, some of this some of the first few minutes here will seem uh, a little uh, bit of review. I'll try to get through that stuff quickly and get into the meat. But our goal in this session is to give you a sense of what to expect when you uh, when you when you sign up for uh, Project Beacon with with your school and your organization, and uh, basically how to how to get started operating the platform. Um, most of the, the challenges that you'll, you'll face are just sort of getting up and running and getting started. There's just sort of a little bit uh, to do there, but we'll walk through those steps and uh, hopefully we'll all have a better understanding of how everything works on the flip side. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about um, us, Project Beacon is uh, a social benefit organization, meaning we uh, are not registered as a nonprofit, but we are chartered to have no profit motive. Any, any uh, revenue, any profits that, that we make need to be put back into the program or donated to charity at the end. Uh, and we were formed uh, this spring by uh, the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, F Prime Capital, which is the venture capital arm of Fidelity, and GV, which is the venture arm of Google, uh, to really drive uh, and improve the capacity, accessibility, and affordability of COVID-19 testing, uh, primarily here in Massachusetts. And we, we're, a, we're a small team, we're a, a, an early stage team. Uh, as, as I said, we've existed only for you know, dozens of weeks now, uh, but we uh, have really been able to start offering end-to-end -end testing uh, from registration and scheduling, site management, sample collection, resulting reporting, uh, and follow-up. And we chiefly prioritize the needs of Massachusetts and its residents. So that's part of the reason why we're here. Uh, we, we love to be able to collaborate with the state uh, and, and see if we can help uh, solve some thorny challenges that, that COVID has, has brought up upon all of us. Uh, we also have a bit of a Robin Hood approach where we, we do work with uh, employers to staff and handle their testing programs as well, but we charge the private sector a bit more so that we can help better serve the public sector and these types of use cases. And um, we're, we collaborate with organizations across the country to share what we've learned uh, here in Massachusetts and New England uh, more broadly so that uh, those lessons can be put in, into place uh, everywhere possible. Uh, but mostly the reason why we're here is that schools are really important to us. My kid Spencer is in the red shirt there. He definitely is not dressed that way today. Uh, but we, we all rely on schools and uh, their ability to be open and be open safely is critically important to us. So anything that we can do along the way uh, is, is something that we're, we're eager to really help with. Um, and so I, obviously, we, we help serve K-12 to uh, organizations, and I mentioned our employer programs. Uh, we also work with vulnerable populations, colleges and universities, and we run some public test sites, which is perhaps how we're, we're best known in Massachusetts. Uh, we run uh, now, well, as of tomorrow, four large uh, high-capacity test sites. Our first one was in uh, Revere. And uh, we also have them in New Bedford, Framingham, and tomorrow we open a, a new one in Lynn. And each of these are designed to be able to uh, handle uh, 
thousands of patients uh, every day getting tested and to do it really efficiently. So um, they're all uh, by appointment, but open to the public and free of charge. And as you can see in some of our metrics, uh, a visit to a, a Project Beacon powered test site typically takes something like three to four minutes from check-in to completion. It may take longer that, than that to get an appointment because the demand has been crazy. Uh, right now we have 10 people every second trying to get an appointment at one of our tech, test sites. So it's, it's really challenging on that side, but that's why we're working hard to really improve uh, the capacity that, that we have to test uh, as many people as possible. And as I mentioned, we also have private testing sites for employers and schools. Sometimes these are just uh, a person, a laptop and a printer, uh, and other times they, they can be quite large and have, have a pretty big capacity. And most of our testing so far historically has been RT-PCR molecular tests that, that most of you are familiar with, uh, but increasingly, and, and obviously in this case, we're supporting, supporting some point of care testing, some antigen testing, including the Abbott by Next Now test that we'll be talking about more today. So our biggest um, project and product at, product Be at Project Begin is the platform that we, we build, which is a, a mobile web responsive platform, meaning it works on anything with a web browser. So anyone with a smartphone, anyone with a laptop or a tablet, uh, it'll work on that. You don't have to download an app or anything like that. But it really tries to facilitate uh, managing a testing program from start to finish. And at the start, uh, that might be personnel and program management. So maintaining and creating the rosters of the people who, who are in your program, facilitating their registration and consent, uh, and not just the consent, but capturing the necessary demographic information for, uh, for state reporting. Conducting the tests, which is obviously an important part. We want to do that quickly and, and easily and capturing the results uh, in this case along the way. Uh, and then sharing with appropriate parties, uh, which is, is uh, parents and guardians. So we want to make sure that they know that a result is available and have, have quick and easy access to it. Uh, the individuals who are tested uh, when, they're, when they're at the age of majority and public health authorities uh, like DPH uh, here in Massachusetts. And we want to we want to make that as easy as possible so that there is as little paperwork and legwork as, as we can possibly manage. So as we get into how this works, that's that's sort of the end of my preamble. Um, I, I want to walk through a couple of concepts that are important to understand uh, at the outset so that then we can use those terms throughout and you'll you'll know what what the heck it is I mean. Uh, and the, the main concepts here are that we have three different types of users in our system. Uh, and all three of them get used in this case, uh, but two of them are different types of organizational users. So they're, they're sort of special privileged uh, members of your organization or your school. The first is, is we call organization admins. And so organization admins are the people who have access to the rosters, who should be tested, when were they tested? How were they tested? What is all their demographic and profile information? Uh, and so we're thinking that in general, these folks are going to be uh, administrators, uh, might be a school nurse as well, depending on exactly how you're anticipating running this at your school. Uh, but it's important to know that anybody who is an org admin, that's what we sort of call it for shorthand, uh, is going to have access to lots of information about everybody who uh, is is being tested in the system. So it's important that they be uh, sort of trusted members of, of, the, of the school community there. The second role is a test site admin. Um, and those are the folks who are actually going to be running the tests and, uh, and providing follow-up contact for patients uh, who, who might have had a, a positive result, things like that. Um, this is probably going to be folks like a school nurse and, and their support staff. Uh, anybody who's going to be actually performing the test and inputting those results needs to be a test site admin. And you can be both of those at the same time. So the school nurse may be an org admin. They also may be a test site admin. Um, but you, you may choose to have those be uh, different folks at, at your organization. And then aside from that, there are the folks who are being tested, which we normally just call users or patients. Uh, and these are the, these are the people who uh, need to register, they need to consent, and they need to receive results uh, after after their tests have been performed. So with those three concepts sort of laid out there, 
uh, we can start uh, talking about the concepts of how to create an account. And so many of you have been, um, ha have already uh, gone through this pro process, either completely or partially, but uh, the state ha is providing an account registration form, uh, I think in the coming uh, hours, days, uh, something like that, Brett, we should be having uh, a revised uh, account registration form that might be a, a little bit easier to follow. Uh, but once you've filled out that form, we get that information on our end, and then we go and, and put it into our system so that we can create the accounts directly. And there are a few registration tips that uh, are worth sharing to make sure that this is as successful as possible. Uh, the first, and, and this is this is more, more guidance than, than rule, we're generally expecting to see registrations from schools, not districts. And it's important to know that we don't have the concept in our system of organizations within organizations. So if you were to register as a district, then um, all of your district information, all of your district personnel, every every student who's registered, every staff member who's registered will be under the same umbrella. And so those org admins and those test site admins will have access to all of that, which may be exactly what you want. Um, I can imagine a lot of scenarios where it may just be easier and you're not concerned about uh, those lines. But basically, at that point, a school nurse would be able to uh, check in and test anyone from across the district, and an org admin would be able to see information uh, about anyone in the district. So if that's something that you want, uh, that can be okay. But generally speaking, we've been expecting to see schools registering uh, individually, not districts. Secondly, um, there are two types of IDs that you need to enter into the form. First is the CLIA ID that um, you, you need to, to operate in this program. Uh, make sure that what you're sending us is 10 characters. Uh, it's usually two numbers, a letter, and then seven numbers. Uh, we've occasionally seen some things that don't look like CLIA IDs, and then we need to reach back out and uh, find out what's going on with those, and that can, that can take up some time. Provider NPIs are, are also uh, things worth looking at. Those need to be 10 digits. Make sure that those are accurate. Um, when, when you fill out the form, uh, and this will be improved in our, in our new form, but uh, you'll want to make sure that you're providing the first name, last name, and email of all the admins that you need in the system. Uh, if you just give us an email address, then unfortunately we can't create an account just based on that. Our system really needs a first and last name to accompany that. Uh, and so that's another reason why we might have to go back and ask for more information. Um, there was a, for, a form issue here where the when you were typing in your address, it asked you to make sure that your address was a number greater than zero, which is a very strange requirement for an address. Uh, some folks were, were clever about that and uh, filled out their, their zip code, which uh, we need a full address for the schools. We fixed that issue in the form, uh, or I believe the state has at this point. Uh, but we, anytime we're asking for an address, we need to make sure it's the full address. And then just lastly, uh, and this, this is uh, sort of basic, but double check your info. Uh, we've had some typos in email addresses. And so folks have said, um, hey, some of our people didn't get their invitation email. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, there was a, you know, dot .com instead of dot .com at the end of an email address or something like that. And, and while sometimes we might catch those, uh, it's not always going to be the case. And, and it, it may be tricky to figure out what's going on there. So, um, so with that, once you've, once you've filled out the registration form, as I mentioned, we get that information and we work through the list as quickly as, as we can. Uh, some of these types of issues have gummed up the works there, so it's a little slower than we would like, but we're, we're getting down into a rhythm at this point and, uh, and basically entering in organizations in the order in which they were received. And you should get an invitation as a result of that to uh, sign up for a Project Beacon account or to, uh, if you already have a Project Beacon account, you should get an email uh, showing that you've been invited to, to join your new organization. Uh, and if you have any issues with that, you can always reach out to help at beacontesting.com and we're, we're happy to make any tweaks or, or fix any issues that came up in that registration process along the way. From there, uh, the next big thing that you're going to want to do is figure out the strategy for, for your roster. And this can be a little bit different depending on, on the organization, but we basically have two mechanisms for getting people into the system. Uh, I guess really we have three mechanisms. 
uh, but two of them are, are going to be really useful to organizations here. Um, one of them is to uh, upload a, a CSV file, so basically a spreadsheet of, um, uh, of the information of all of the students and or staff in your organization and uploading that to us and having us churn through that and uh, and send out invitations to everybody who need to set up their accounts. Um, the other way, which we uh, is, is brand new for us and we should be literally releasing now-ish in the next couple hours, is instead of uploading a roster, you can, uh, we can create for you an invitation code, which basically when you can share with your school community so that when they sign up, uh, they would enter this invitation code or they would click on the special link. And with that, they would be associated with your organization. So you wouldn't need to share their information with us in the first place. And there are a few reasons why you might want to use the invitation code uh, approach. Uh, namely, if uh, your district is not able to send uh, directory information to a third party for compliance reasons, uh, that would be a pretty good reason. Uh, or if you uh, feel like it might just be easier for folks to sort of opt in and take that approach, it takes no time, no administrative uh, challenges associated with that. You just sort of communicate with your school community the way you normally would, and you include this invitation code or link. Um, but for the purposes of, of this webinar, I want to talk through the process of uploading the roster. Uh, that's the more, uh, the more complicated process in certain ways, um, but it may be the right choice for you. So this is your, this is your first look at what you would see when you log into uh, the Project Beacon platform. Uh, everything about the screen is going to be slightly different for you when you log in, but namely, uh, you're going to be looking for the admin menu up at the top of the screen. If you don't see an admin menu at the top of the screen, it means that we haven't associated your account with uh, your organization and, and haven't given you admin privileges, which is a good reason to reach out and, and send us a message, help at beacontesting.com, and we can make those changes uh, and make sure that we, that perhaps there was a typo uh, in, in an email address or something like that, but we can make sure that we get that fixed. But when you, when you see that admin menu and you click on it, uh, you're probably going to see two entries in that list. One is, uh, and I'm, my son goes to Bowen School down the street, so I'm going to use Bowen School as my example. Uh, you're, you're probably going to see Bowen School with the subtext organization, which is uh, where you manage rosters uh, and, and personnel. And then you're going to see Bowen School with test site uh, as the subtext. And that's where, we'll, and we'll talk about this in a few moments, uh, that's where you would uh, actually administer the tests and, and work through the testing process. So in this case, to create a roster, we're going to be dealing with the organizational uh, functionality. So you would click on the organization under the admin menu. And then when you get in there, you, that's going to land you on your organization dashboard, which eventually will have some helpful metrics about how many tests you've run and how many people have registered and those types of things. But it's going to be really boring at the start. So you're, you're going to want to skip to the personnel tab, uh, which is uh, which we're pointing out with the arrow here. And once you're on the personnel tab, you're going to click the add personnel button uh, that we're pointing to here. Uh, this screen is going to eventually have some nice metrics about each of the groups that you might have set up here. Uh, we've created two groups for the schools that we've registered. We've created a students group and a staff group, but you could choose to group people uh, really however you'd like. It could be by classroom, it could be by grade, it could be by anything there. Students and staff is probably a pretty good way to get started. Uh, and so uh, again, this screen will be really boring when you first start out. Uh, but as you add people and start testing, uh, you'll see a little bit more, uh, you'll get a little bit more interesting metrics here. But to get to continue to get started on the roster, you're going to click the, the big add personnel button, and then you're going to have two choices. If you only need to add one person, then that's simple. You can create a single record. You don't have to give us a CSV or anything like that. And, and maybe this still works if you want to uh, get your staff on a, a few members of your staff on board to sort of kick the tires. Uh, but if you're doing more than, you know, five, seven, ten of these, you're probably going to want to want to upload a file. Uh, and that's going to be the second option to click on. At that point, you'll be on the upload screen. And there are two things that you can really do here. One is download the template, uh, which is probably the first thing you want to do. That's going to download a CSV file to your computer. And that's something that you can open with uh, Excel or Google Sheets. 
Um, and then once you've finished, this is also the place where you would select that file and upload it. But really, I want to take a moment to dive into that spreadsheet and, uh, and give you a few hints about uh, what's necessary here and, and how to move forward. Um, this, this spreadsheet, we're looking at this in, in Google Sheets right now, so it doesn't have to be in Excel, uh, is, is basically going to be really bare bones when you open it. You'll see a lot of columns, and each of those columns is for uh, a piece of info that is required for state reporting, but that doesn't mean it's required for you to give to us. Uh, only, the, only the ones with an asterisk um, are things that we actually require uh, in, that, in that upload. And uh, you, you can't quite see the asterisk in the third column, but first name, last name, and either email address or mobile phone number are uh, required to actually kick off an account here. And in, in this case, uh, because we have two different types of consents uh, in our Massachusetts Binax program, uh, the last column, which you also can't see here, is the name of the consent form that this person needs to fill out. Uh, so let me, let me dive into a couple of things here. Um, the first and last name should be uh, those of the people being tested. So in, in my case, my son's name is Spencer. So you would have first name Spencer, last name Wilkinson. And then the, the contact info, the email or mobile number would be for, uh, if, if this is an adult, then it might be theirs as well. If this is a child or a student, uh, then it's probably their parents' contact info. So. Uh, you know, you'd have Spencer's first name, Wilkinson his last name, and then uh, J Wilkinson at beacontesting.com for the email address there. Um, and you know, a mobile number is is just fine as well. Like I mentioned, we treat mobile number, we treat text messages and emails both as first class citizens. Uh, so either of those is totally acceptable in that column. And then if you were to scroll all the way to the right and see the consent column, then we need to have. Um, one of those two values that we've highlighted in yellow there. And we'll send out uh, the slide so that you have this information for sure. Uh, but in the case of Spencer, you'd want the second one. So it needs to be exactly like this, uh, MA Desi space dash space parent slash guardian consent. And if this is a staff member uh, or a, a, a student who is not a minor in, in, uh, in say high school, then you would use the adult consent form. That's the only way we know which consent form to give them when they sign up. We're not you know, basing it on date of birth or anything like that. So it's important that you tell us uh, along the way. If you want to, you can fill out all of these columns with that information. Um, but any columns that aren't filled out are things that we're gonna ask the, the patient when they sign up. So if you don't give us a date of birth, or address or city, state, zip, et cetera, that's fine. We're gonna ask, uh, we're gonna ask the uh, family member or the staff member when they sign up to fill in all that uh, additional information. And I would say that that's the typical thing to do is to have those four pieces of information, first, last, email or mobile, and the name of the consent form that they need to use. So once you've filled out those, uh, that information, uh, you'll save this uh, back down. You'll have your CSV file that's been filled out. And then you'll go back to your web browser and choose that file. And uh, then you're gonna have this option to assign the people in that file to a group. Like I mentioned, we've created two groups for you, a, a student uh, and a staff uh, group. And so if you did an upload of your staff, you might associate them with the staff group. If uh, you had another one of students, you could associate them with the students group. It's totally okay to do multiple uploads and to do one grade at a time or, or something like that. It might be, might be wise to do it that way to just get your, get your feet wet. Uh, you don't have to, you can, you can throw as many as you like into this and, and we should be able to handle it. Once you do it, you'll, uh, Either, we'll either tell you that there might have been some errors in that. So if we uh, detected that uh, an email address was misformed uh, or that there was a missing consent form name or something like that, then we'll tell you. Uh, but if everything checks out, then you're going to get this upload summary page that shows you the first few records in that just to make sure that everything looks approximately right and that you know names are in the right spot and email addresses are in the right spot. And then you go ahead and click the big blue button and we send out invites to everybody uh, at that point with, within, uh, within a couple minutes. We tell the server, here's a list of invites to send out. And you know, typically within, 
within five or 10 minutes, those uh, text messages or emails should be in the inboxes of the folks that you listed. So I know that that was a lot to walk through, uh, but I'm happy to take a couple questions and, and give any clarifying uh, information about the roster process or how to go through that. And again, I wanna remind that we'll have that alternate um, pr procedure where we can uh, give you an invitation code and you can share that out with the members of your school community. And that would effectively bypass uh, this process. So you wouldn't need to upload a roster for those individuals. You would just share the invitation code with them or the special link with them. And uh, by using that, they would be added to your roster as soon as they sign up and it would be them sharing the information, not you sharing their information uh, on their behalf. But anything that was um, super unclear there that I can dive into a little bit? Actually, we just had a really good question that I want to, to broadcast is a question about for international students, what contact information should we use? And it should be their contact information. Right. Yeah. It, it, it should be the information that, that they can be contacted with. So um, the, I think the school's address and phone number is, uh, is pretty appropriate in those cases. Um, and uh, I think it's a really good, good question. Like, I'm not actually sure if this is, if they're, if they're minors, what exactly the arrangements, the uh, sort of custodial arrangements are there, but um, the, the individual's contact information. And then when it comes to the, the parental consent, um, I don't know if there are other arrangements that, that make a lot of good sense there. I'm not probably the best person to ask about that. Yeah, Nicole, go ahead. So thank you. Um, so where would we get the invitation code if we need yeah. to do that? Because, and I guess why I'm asking is because I don't know if we are allowed to share our demographic information with the third party, that's, I guess, the first question to the super, to our superintendent. Um, and then okay. if he, you know what I mean? Like, and if we can't uh, because of FERPA, then we would just, like you said, bypass it by offering the staff and students um, this invitation code. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And even if you don't have perfect concerns, I think that there's a lot to, to speak for the invitation code process. It might just be easier for, for a lot of you. Um, and so the best way to do that, as soon as we uh, release our, um, release that, that feature, which as I said, should be, you know, today-ish. Uh, so probably tomorrow, we will start sending out uh, emails to uh, to the to the main contacts for uh, your your school, your registered account, uh, with those invitation codes and an example of how to use them. So uh, we would follow up on that. And and yeah, Nicole, yours is a, whether whether you do it, whether your district does have FERPA concerns or not. That's a perfectly legit reason to do so. But you don't need any particular reason to use the invitation code flow. It might just be easier for you. And make a lot of sense. So um, we'll we'll be following up, and we'll auto create those codes. Uh, so they'll just be, you know, several letters uh, that that folks will use. Uh, and uh, if you if you have any if you run into any challenges with it, then you can always email help at beacontesting.com. Or if you don't hear from us, you can always email help at beacontesting.com, and uh, we will we will get back to you as promptly as we can and make sure we get it right. Go ahead. <laughs> And just one more thing. So tomorrow, Project Beacon, your company will be sending the contact person in our district. Like I, I think my superintendent, Matt DeAndrea, um, emailed on behalf of our all of our districts. Is that so? He would get an email with these uh, invitation codes. Yeah, we haven't. So I think at a minimum, we would send it to to those, but we might also send it to the organization admin. So uh, so it could be that more than one person gets it. But yeah, we'll tr we'll try to get those out out tomorrow ish, um, and 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 get those out pretty promptly as long as the release uh, today goes well. So if it bleeds into that, then we might need a few extra hours here or there. But yeah, that's that's the goal is to get this out before uh, the holidays so that folks can uh, you know do do whatever they need to do or test it out a little bit. Got it. Thank you. Sure thing. Any other questions before I move on into how to actually test people? <clears throat> All right. So um, 
for those of you who uh, have have been to a, a Project Beacon test site, um, we operate entirely uh, with with appointments, and that's not going to be the case here. So we do want we are we're going to start using what we call hybrid mode, which uh, allows you to to optionally create appointment blocks. Although in this case for this program, we don't necessarily recommend it, um, but it also allows you to just check in uh, folks who walk up, which is really the idea behind uh, the state's program here of testing uh, symptomatic kids who, who are in school. So uh, if, if a child has uh, a sniffle or something and, uh, the, and, and their teacher is uh, concerned about it and they send that child down to the, to the office, uh, we want to make sure that we can accommodate that without somebody having uh, an appointment or anything like that. So. Uh, the, the gist here is that uh, in this case, we're going to use that same admin menu, but instead of going to the organization, we're going to go to the test site uh, here. So it's a, a different item in that drop down. But then you're going to land on a page that looks like this. And the top part is sort of, it, it says appointments, but those are really like your, that's really your working area. So uh, folks that you've encountered or are working with on, on tests right now are going to appear in the top section. And then you're going to have everybody uh, down in the bottom section. And you can see that uh, it's paginated, so you can kind of flip through pages. Uh, but you can also search by, by the name or the email address. Uh, or if you chose to, to upload student IDs or something like that to us, you could also search by that. Uh, and so oftentimes, let's say that Timothy, uh, Timmy walks into the office, you're probably going to start off by searching for his name. So you might type in Timothy. Uh, and then once you've found him, uh, you're going to go ahead and hit the, the check-in button there. And that's really what's going to get everything started. Um, we're all, we're going to assume at this point that the patient has pre-registered and consented. They've either been uploaded uh, with your roster or they've gone ahead and used that invitation code that you sent along to them and they've completed their profile and consented, uh, which makes them eligible to test with our system. We'll talk a little bit later about what to do if that hasn't uh, uh, in fact happened. So once you click the check-in button, you're going to get this uh, window that pops up to, to get started with a new test. It's going to have a little bit of the basic personal information about this patient. Uh, that just makes sure that if you have, you know, two Jane Smiths in your school, that uh, you can clarify which one's which. You may uh, ask them their date of birth or something like that. You may just have relationships with all your students and know exactly who they are, in which case this, this could be totally fine. Uh, but there is one bit of data entry that you're going to need to uh, enter here, and it's called the serial number. Uh, but in the case of Binax Now tests, that's going to be the lot number. Uh, and so on the side of the Binax Now boxes, not the individual tests, but the boxes that they come in, there's a lot number on that box. And you're going to want to enter in the lot number of the test kit you're using. Um, we then append a timestamp to it, uh, which can act as the serial number in our case. And, uh, and that'll help get things moving. So uh, once you've done that and you've, you've clicked the check-in button, you'll see that the, that the person that you just checked in moves into that top section, into that uh, appointments table. And uh, you'll see that there's a check-in time associated with that and that the lot number is showing up next to, next to their name. And then you'll go ahead where the arrow is and, and click the collect button uh, to, to once you've uh, actually run uh, and collected the sample, uh, you can click that collected button. And so in this case, uh, for Binax Now, for those of you who have gone through the training, uh, you know that you're uh, using the nasal swab to, to swab the patient. You're then putting the swab into the, into the cardboard sleeve and you're, I think, dropping some reagent onto it. And, uh, and at that point, you can click the collected button and mark that test as having been collected. Uh, we take a timestamp for that, and then we hopefully, helpfully, uh, start a 15-minute timer for you. Uh, so that timer is going to start at 15 minutes. It's going to count down to zero. You can start testing somebody else at that point. You can have 15 of these going if there are 15 kids that, uh, or staff members that need a test. They can all happen simultaneously, and each one will have their own timer associated with it. Uh, and... Uh, and, and, and so this is the sort of prescribed amount of time for that Binax Now test. 
once that uh, timer counts down to zero, the row for that patient is going to turn green so that you notice it in the in, in the table. Uh, and you'll find that there's a new button there that says record results. Uh, so we don't show the record results button until the 15 minutes have passed just to make sure that uh, you've waited a long enough time for uh, those results to become apparent. Uh, but once, once you're ready there, uh, you can interpret the test results and you can record them here. Uh, we're going to verify the, the lot number at that point. That should be pre-filled out. You don't have to fill it back in. Um, but then uh, you can choose which test result uh, you've, you've determined from, from the test kit and that's positive, negative, or invalid. And as you guys know, in this case on, on the Binax now, um, there are a few reasons why you might have invalid, no control line, a blue control line, uh, but, uh, negatives are, are one pink purple line and positives are two pink purple lines. So you interpret that result and, uh, you go ahead and mark that here. And as soon as you hit the save button, a few things happen. Um, one is that we obviously record the result in our system and we remove it from that appointments table because you're no longer working on that patient. Uh, we, we instead, I'll show you where it goes in a second. We also send a notification to uh, the patient or the patient's parent, whoever is, uh, whoever's contact information is associated with that, with that account. They're going to get a notification either via email or text that uh, a result is now available and they can log into uh, the Project Beacon website and see that result. Uh, so that'll happen, uh, you know, again, with, within seconds to minutes of you hitting that button. And we're also gonna send that result to uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health uh, for their public health reporting system. So uh, we'll handle the public health reporting there. I believe that there still is a requirement from DESI for uh, a positive test for uh, you to give them a call so that they can uh, record that positive test as uh, in addition to uh, us handling the public health reporting. But those three things will basically happen. From your perspective, you'll see that name disappear from your list. And then if you click on the results tab, uh, which we're pointing to up here, then you're going to have a list of all the results uh, from tests that you've worked on on that day. You can see that there's a little date picker there. So you can choose a different day to see the tests from another day. Um, but basically, this is a tool so that not only can you see the results uh, from, from the course of the day, but you can also keep track of who uh, you've contacted as follow-up. So um, you uh, most likely you're, you're going to want to be contacting uh, the families of, of patients that tested positive. Uh, so we have a couple on the screen here. And, uh, you know, you can effectively, once you've successfully gotten in contact with them, you can click the mark as contacted button and it'll record a timestamp associated with that so you can keep track of who you've contacted and who you still have to contact. Uh, there are a couple of little extra features that might be helpful. If you click the three dots on the side, you can leave yourself some notes. Uh, so maybe you tried to contact them twice and, uh, you know, you, you want to leave a note for yourself that this is the third time that you're doing it, or maybe there are some notes about what you talked with a parent about uh, that you want to keep track of there. And you can do that via uh, the, a menu item in the, uh, the three dots on the side, optionally. So that's the process of operating, you know, sort of a test and getting from, from start to finish through the test. It's intended to be just a few clicks. The only information that you need to enter is that lot number uh, and the result itself. Uh, but otherwise, we're checking a patient in, we're marking their sample as collected and starting the timer, then we're recording the result when that timer has gotten down to zero. And then uh, if they're positive, you can mark them, you can contact their family and, and mark the, them as having been contacted. Uh, and so uh, that is that is basically the flow. Any major questions that I can answer for folks about that? I see. Um, I see a question. Uh, to be clear, they will probably have been contacted automatically by us first. They will have gotten a notification about their result. Uh, they won't necessarily, they won't have gotten a uh, notification from a clinician or uh, they'll, they'll have gotten some basic guidance uh, that, the, that the state has uh, sort of worked with us to, to put in place there. So they'll see some general guidance, but, but um, you, I believe, um, I think that there is a requirement to follow up with those patients who are positive from a clinician. Uh, 
<clears throat> so uh, I imagine that you would you would use that feature for that. But they probably already have gotten a text message or an email about the result itself. All right, and then the last piece uh, of, of sort of major walkthrough information in this is remember that big blue screen that was really loud and annoying earlier on that said, hey, we're assuming uh, that people who, who whom you're testing uh, have consented and that they filled out all the relevant information. Uh, this is what happened. This is the workaround. If uh, you need to test somebody and uh, they haven't already been signed up in the system or their uh, their parents haven't completed the consent form, and this is this is how we can uh, help you record consent uh, that you've obtained manually. So the main way to to know that somebody needs to, that somebody still has something to do here. Uh, that they either ha don't have a complete profile or that they haven't consented, is that when you go to check them in, uh, you won't be able to check them in. You'll have this uh, sort of orange message, an orange icon that says the profile is incomplete and they are ineligible to receive a test. Uh, so when that happens, you need to sort of, you are in test site mode here, you were about to run a test. You need to sort of switch hats and go into org admin mode. And uh, once again, you're going to go into that up to your admin menu into the organization screen because we're basically going to need to fill out uh, the, the profile on behalf of the patient uh, and probably either in concert with a paper form that their parents have, have filled out or uh, if your school is comfortable with it, uh, you, there's an option to get, to get verbal consent over a phone uh, to, to get a test done. But, we're going to switch to our organization menu uh, item from the admin menu, and we're going to go back to the personnel screen. And now we're going to search for, uh, you know, Timothy or whoever it is we're looking for. Uh, so you're going to type in their name here. And once you've pulled up their name, uh, you can go ahead and click on the edit profile info link. And uh, once you do that, you're going to see basically the same form that they see when they're signing up with a, with a couple of small uh, differences but it's going to have their first, middle, last. Um, you can fill out, a, we call it an employee ID, but it could be a student ID. Um, that's just for helping you search for people, but in, in most cases, it's probably not necessary. Um, you'll see that we have a drop down for choosing which group a person is in. So if you need to adjust what group someone's in, you can do it there. You can see the consent form is defined there. Uh, and, and then other things like date of birth, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, some of those are going to be easy to fill out. Others of those might be something that you need to work with the parent on uh, to, to determine what the right answer is. Uh, but then down at the bottom, we have a check mark, uh, a checkbox for consent received. And when we, when we get a change to that item, we record who did it and what time it was. So we know whether this was something, whether consent was recorded by, uh, you know, the, the, the school's nurse or whether it was re recorded by uh, you know, the parent or guardian of the patient or the patient themselves if they were, if they were staff. So if you are on the phone with a parent, you're like, I'd like to get them tested. And the parent's like, oh, I would like to get them tested too. Uh, you can work with them to fill out this form in its entirety. Um, obviously there are some things that don't need to be filled out like street address too. If they don't have one, then that's obviously fine. But most of the fields are, are required here. Um, and then if they consent to, to testing, uh, either on paper or if you, if you guys are comfortable over the phone, then you can click off that consent received box. And at that point, the patient will be, uh, will be ready for testing. And you would basically uh, go back to that, put your test admin hat back on, go back to the uh, test site uh, screen. And when you go to check in that patient, they shouldn't have the orange icon next to it. And you should be able to check them in. Uh, just like normal at that point. So basically the flow here is you run into the warning sign, you go into org admin mode, find that person, find that, that student or that staff member, fill out their profile uh, and check off consent, making sure that they're uh, consented along the way. And then you'll be able to uh, go ahead and check them in as normal. Did that make sense? Any, any questions about that flow? Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. I'm sorry. And so just a quick um, question about that. So if you're doing this um, on the spot because they don't have consent, you're going to see the orange icon. That's your clue that they didn't have the consent. 
Um, remember how I asked that earlier question about bypassing the demographics? So this would be like verbal consent and filling out the demographics all in one because that's part of the consent, right? That's right. Most people who have one issue probably also have the other issue. It'll be unusual for somebody to have a completely filled out demographics profile and not have consented. So I think that's I think that's right. You're probably going to be filling out both uh, pieces there. Okay. And so you could either fill it out that way or you said there was a paper way to do it. Well, uh, the getting consent, um, this was this was covered a little bit on the on the Desi call a couple of weeks ago, but the um, there are two recommended approaches uh, that Desi has has put out there. One, and, and this is mainly for um, organizations that have FERPA concerns and and can't use electronic uh, consenting for whatever reason, but you can send home uh, consent forms and, and the, the, the templates for those uh, Desi has on their sort of by next testing website. Uh, so you can, you can sort of grab those and send those home with families. And if they fill out all that information and send it back inside, then you would use basically the same process to fill in that information proactively. Or uh, you can, you, uh, Desi said that if your organization is comfortable with it, you can do it over the phone. Uh, and get that same information that way. As long as you're getting consent to the same things, uh, then that is then that can be acceptable depending on uh, on your school and your organization and your comfort level with doing that. I, I understand that some schools are not going to be comfortable with phone consenting, but um, but it, it is an option in this case. Yeah. Another question the nurses and I were discussing today was if there is a positive antigen with this test, this Binex Now test, then we don't want to assume this, but don't you have to go for a confirmatory PCR? And then, because there was not really any information about that, is that like an automatic that they have to go for the PCR? And um, Right, so let me, let me uh, read to you the guidance that's going to be shared with patients when, uh, when they have a positive in this case. So this, is, this uh, came from, from the state DPH and DESI. Um, Results from an antigen test are considered preliminary and may need to be confirmed by a second type of test, a PCR test. You should follow up with your healthcare provider and consider PCR testing for COVID to definitively confirm the test result. If, a piece, if the PCR test is taken within two days of, of the antigen test is negative, COVID-19 infection is ruled out. So I'll, I'll uh, paste that into the chat because, you know, always Thanks. tough to uh, absorb those things live. But <clears throat> the, uh, but that's the guidance that's given out here. So it's not um, strictly required uh, necessarily. The, the performance of these antigen tests is good. Uh, it is not as uh, ideal as having a, a, a confirmation via PCR. Um, but you know, that's, that's sort of the guidance there that it's not strictly required. Um, question in the chat that I see from, from June, if you use the paper consent forms, how do you fill it out in the upload file? Um, so uh, you, you can either, uh, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, swing backwards here a little bit to the, the CSV file. So when you're looking at the CSV file, all the other information that's, uh, that's asked in the paper consent forms uh, is available here um, for, you, for you to fill out and, and, and handle there. If you're doing these sort of one by, if you're doing these all in bulk, then, um, then yeah, there's a fair amount of data entry here. Again, I would sort of recommend that uh, if you're an organization that has FERPA concerns that you use the uh, invitation code mechanism. It's just, it's probably going to make your life easier, but I can understand why there might be reasons why, why you can't do that. Uh, but if, if you are uploading a roster as a result of the paper consent forms, then you would uh, fill out one row for each uh, patient and fill their information all the way across. Uh, and then you would, you know, be able to go ahead and, and upload it in that case. Uh, you may use, if, if you don't have an email address that uh, you're able to share or something like that, uh, some organizations use uh, like a dummy email address or the school nurse's email address for that email or mobile number. There are a few options that you have there to, to sort of get past that hurdle if, if it presents uh, a challenge for you. 
The other thing that I would say is that if you're just doing these uh, one or two at a time, then when you're when you're going through the uh, personnel screens here, uh, there is another option in addition to uploading a file. You have the option of creating a single record. And if you're just doing this one or two at a time, uh, that's going to be your easiest take. You don't want to have to make a file and upload it and deal with that. You can just hit create single record. And that's going to bring up the form that looks basically like what we were just looking at earlier, where you fill out the fields on the website and check off consented at the bottom. And uh, that'll get recorded instantly. You won't have to upload anything or, or anything from there. So that's probably an easier workflow for small numbers or, you know, doing your... The, the four that came in yesterday, or even the, even the, I would, I would say on my end, if it was more than like, you know, 10, I would start thinking about an upload file. But even, even if it were 15, I might say, all right, I'm just going to power through this and create single records 15 times. That might uh, end up being easier if you uh, have to do the data entry off the forms anyway. So a few options there. Hopefully that was helpful. So a um, couple of last, let me just, sorry for skipping back through the slides here. A couple of last quick tips, uh, just familiarizing yourself with the interface here. <clears throat> um, because we've built this uh, for public testing as well, and because we built this so that parents can uh, help orchestrate the care of their kids, um, we, have the uh, we have the concept where one user account can have multiple profiles. And so um, when you click on your name in the upper uh, right-hand corner and you get the drop down there, uh, you'll see that section of the menu toward the bottom that says other profiles. Uh, and this is what you would see if, if uh, you were logged in under my account. Um, you can see the second one, uh, well, the first one says M. Jackson Wilkinson. If you're wondering what the heck the M is, my parents decided to name me Michael Jackson Wilkinson, which is, um, you know, awkward. Uh, but, you know, I, I use my middle name. So the second one you'll see is my employee uh, profile for Project Beacon. So getting tested through my employer is there. That's sort of what you would see on yours. You would see your name and then the name of your school or, or your district, perhaps, if you're registering as an entire district underneath it. And that um, is the profile that, that has access to that school testing program. Uh, the, the, the one that you see above it with the M. Jackson Wilkinson, that's not associated with an organization. That's a public profile. So that's where I could go to the Revere testing site or something like that and get tested. And if I clicked on um, either of those, then I sort of switch modes. And so, uh, and then you can see my kid is also associated at the bottom, Spencer Wilkinson, that doesn't have an organization listed. So that's a public profile as well. So there's a world where if Bowen's school down the street started using this program, I would have another profile in the list for him that would say Bowen's school. If I had other kids, they would appear in this list as well. And so you might have a fair number of profiles in the list. So it's, it's just worth you understanding um, that uh, that it's easy to switch profiles. You just click on the profile that you want to switch to. And so if somebody uh, says to you, I'm not sure what's going on, but it looks like I can book testing at like Revere or Framingham or Lynn or something like that, it probably means that they're just using their public profile right now and they can go up to that menu and switch to their school profile and complete uh, all the demographics and, and those types of things. So. Uh, that's something that a few folks have run into. We're kind of redesigning this a little bit to make it a little easier and a little more obvious in these use cases. But um, I, I just want to give a little bit of a heads up about that, that that's an area that we can improve a little bit. And then finally, I just want to talk about emails. Um, <clears throat> System-wide, we have well over 90% of our emails uh, successfully delivered um, and generally not into spam boxes and those types of things. But that 0.8% is almost all corporate email systems. And um, yes, your, your school systems do qualify as corporate in this case. So uh, there's usually, there's often a lot of aggressive filtering there. So if you have any concerns about that, it's especially uh, something to be aware of for, for staff who are registering. Uh, if you find that a lot of things get blocked in, in your experience, drop a message to help at beacontesting.com and we can send info for your IT department to uh, whitelist those emails. Uh, that's something that they hopefully should be able to do. Parents uh, who use their personal email addresses shouldn't have problems receiving uh, the messages in general. 
Uh, and then, like I mentioned, uh, we'll have that invitation code, uh, which sort of bypasses that need to wait around for an invitation email. Uh, you would just share the invitation code and they sign themselves up, which uh, can, can sort of sidestep some of those issues along the way. So if you have issues with that, reach out to us uh, and we're happy to, to help out and walk through things. Um, we've been working on documentation for all of these things, plus a few more things help.beacontesting.com. You'll see that there's a whole section for rapid antigen testing at schools uh, that walks through the processes that we just laid out there. Um, we also uh, are completely happy to help either now in, in this session, we have a few minutes left, or later on, help at beacontesting.com is the best way to get a contact, in contact with us. And we are um, staffing up on our support side for this Binax program. So whether it's me who responds to the email, uh, or somebody else on my team. Uh, we really uh, genuinely want to be helpful and want to want to make this as uh, useful a process and useful a, a program as it possibly can be. So with that, that's the, uh, that's the end of my slides and we have a few minutes left to, uh, to cover any questions that, that we might have missed along the way. Nicole, I knew you had one. It's great. I love it. And I'm asking for five other nurses. Love it. Uh, um, thank you. I just asked a question at the beginning about the um, biohazard. What do we, can we just put the test after it's done and double bag it and get rid of it? Is that really not your area? Do we have to just follow OSHA? <laughs> that is really not my area or our area, Project Beacon. Um, I don't know, do we have somebody from DPH or DESI on the on the call still who might have a little guidance there? Um, sure, I can help Jackson. Um, this is a good question. I can't answer it outright. I know that the initial uh, guidance that was put out by Desi did address this, if somewhat briefly. Um, if you still have questions after reading that, please please reach out to Desi directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right, so with that, that is that ends sort of the, the formal bit here. Uh, Brett and I will stick around for a few minutes to make sure that if anybody uh, comes up with a question that was a little delayed that we can answer that. But super appreciate you joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, obviously, uh, hopefully this answered some questions. Obviously, it might have raised other questions. So if we can be helpful, help at beacontesting.com is a great way to get in touch with us. Uh, and uh, really appreciate your time. I hope you have a great uh holidays and hopefully reasonably restful end of 2020. Thanks. Jackson, we just got a fantastic question uh, from June. When we try to upload a file, we got, we got multiple formatting errors. Is there somewhere that's, that states the exact format it needs? And if you already have paper consent, what do you put in the consent field? So you would still put the uh, consent, uh, the, the, the same value into the consent field there, but then you would uh, you would additionally need to go back into the interface and check that box off for that for that patient. Um, we don't currently have a facility for bypassing uh, the consent in the CSV uh, in the file upload, so uh, it would be a two step process where that patient gets either entered in one at a time or uploaded via the CSV. And if it was uploaded via the CSV, then you would need to check them off. Um, but if you were entering them in one at a time and using that. Uh, single record entry, then the check, bar, the check box would be there at the very end and you wouldn't have to do that. So um, yeah, I, I can see that if you, if you have it there and, and you're planning on uploading a bunch of them, uh, there's a little bit of a, of a process there and a, and a two-step process. Uh, but do feel free to reach out to us if there's something that we can uh, help automate or if there's a list of folks that you just want to say like, hey, I've got 100 folks here and they all need to have that consent box checked. Um, let us know and um, and we can we can be helpful on that front if that's uh, if it's looking like a huge pain point.
I'm super curious if people can hear my kids' cartoons from the other room, or if that's or if it's quiet enough that Zoom's canceling that out. <laughs> It's not audible. You're all set. Perfect. Amazing. <clears throat> I was worried about that the entire time, but I was like, you know, if I keep talking, then uh, nobody's going to hear it anyway. So, all right. So, without any further questions, um, thank you all for your time. Again, really appreciate it. And as always, help at beacontesting.com. We'll, we'll be happy to answer stuff in the future. So, take care, everybody, and we'll catch you later. <laughs>